Hi there and welcome back to A Life Worth Living. We've been exploring the secret of Paul's contentment in Christ and how a relationship with Jesus brings meaning and purpose to our lives. In our last session, we looked at how Jesus gives us a new confidence. In this session, we'll see how Jesus gives us a new ambition. As we start, let's pause for a moment in our groups to read the Bible passage we'll be looking at in this session. One of you can pray and then someone else can read Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 21. What do you think when you hear the word ambition? Have you ever wondered whether it's okay for a Christian to be ambitious? Some cannot see the problem. They go to church on Sunday and during the rest of the week, they pursue their own ambitions. Others think that when you become a Christian, you have to give up all personal ambition and simply drift through life, taking whatever comes as God's will, seeing all ambition as sin. The Apostle Paul was fiercely ambitious. Before he was a Christian, Paul had been fiercely ambitious in his desire to persecute the church. After his conversion, he did not lose his ambitious nature, but its direction changed. If anything, he was even more ambitious. He describes himself in this passage as being like an athlete, desperate to win a race. In our last session, we saw that Paul's confidence came from knowing Christ and having his righteousness. As we continue through chapter three, we see Paul move from Christ as the source of his confidence to Christ as the focus of his ambition. So what can we learn from Paul about what our ambitions should be? First, be ambitious to know Christ intimately. Paul's ambition was to know Christ. The Greek word for to know means far more than intellectual knowledge, but includes personal knowledge. Paul's ambition is not just to know about Christ, but to know him as a person. Paul's ambition is to know Christ. It's an intimate, close relationship. This is the new focus of his life. Like Paul, make your ambition not just to know about Christ, but to know him more intimately. Second, be ambitious to experience Christ's resurrection power. Paul's ambition was to know the power of his resurrection, not just as a past event in history, but as a dynamic power at work in his life. Paul says in Romans 8, that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. The Spirit of God brings this resurrection power to our lives. By the power of his death and resurrection, Jesus disarmed Satan, broke hold of sin and defeated death. This power is available to us to live holy lives and serve others with the resurrection power. Like Paul, make it your ambition to know that power more and more. Third, be ambitious to partner in Christ's suffering. For Paul, knowing Christ involves the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. He does not seek suffering, but he sees suffering as an inevitable part of knowing Christ. It is not a penalty, but a privilege. The suffering and death of Jesus is different from ours in that he died for our sins to save us from what we deserve. You will never suffer in exactly the way he did, but sometimes you will suffer for your godly ambition. This suffering is the practical result of our Christian life. For some, this will mean severe persecution. For all of us, it will include, as one commentator says, the struggle against sin, either within or without. It is at these moments of suffering that we experience fellowship with Christ. Make that fellowship your ambition, whatever the cost. Fourth, be ambitious to know your destination. Knowing Christ means sharing his destiny, somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. When Paul says somehow, he is expressing humility, not doubt. Throughout this letter, Paul never doubted that one day we would go to be with Christ. Jackie Pullinger says that God gave her resurrection eyes. She says this, 
Only Jesus opens eyes, but all who believe in the resurrection of the dead know their destination is a place of comfort, a better country, a heavenly city. Paul's future hope does not depend on himself, but on what Christ has done for him on the cross. Yet he is not arrogant about his hope. He is not there yet, but it is his aim and ambition. He is single-minded about his ambition. In verse 13, he says, One thing I do. This does not mean he neglected every other area of his life. Rather, it means that everything else came second to his overriding ambition. The message translation puts it this way. I've got my eye on the goal. Ignatius of Loyola, the Catholic priest, theologian and founder of the Jesuits wrote, human persons are created to praise, reverence and serve God. The other things on the face of the earth are created for us to help us in attaining the purpose for which we were created. Therefore, we are to make use of them in so far as they help us attain our purpose and we should rid ourselves of them in so far as they hinder us from attaining it. It is not wrong to have ambitions for our marriages, family life, career, work and ministry. In fact, it's good that we do. But all these ambitions should come second to our ambition to know Christ. He is our first priority in life and nothing in our life should conflict with that ambition. Chuck Colson was a self-made man. As a student, he arrogantly turned down a scholarship to Harvard. He joined the Marines, set up his own law firm and entered politics. By the age of 40, he had become one of President Nixon's closest advisors. Later, he described himself as a young, ambitious, political kingmaker. He was known as Nixon's hatchet man. He pleaded guilty to his part in the Watergate cover-up scandal and was sent to prison. By then, he'd encountered Jesus. When he left the court after hearing the sentence, he said, what happened in court today was the court's will and the Lord's will. I have committed my life to Jesus Christ and I can work for him in prison as well as out. Colson did just that. After his release, he set up prison fellowship through which Thousands have encountered Jesus. I once heard him say, I was ambitious and I am ambitious today, but I hope it's not for Chuck Colson, although I struggle with that quite a lot as a matter of fact, but I am ambitious for Christ. Ambition has been defined as the desire to succeed. There are ultimately only two controlling ambitions to which all others may be reduced. One is our own glory, and the other is God's glory. Paul was a man who was ambitious for Christ, although no doubt he too struggled with it at times. He sees himself as an athlete for Christ racing in a stadium. Like a runner, the Christian must not look back. Paul says, forgetting what is behind. Don't focus on the past, how far you have fallen, your failures or even your successes. Rather, forgetting what lies behind, keep focused on Jesus, be single-minded, press forward and respond to his call. Continuing with the image of the racer, Paul says in verses 13 and 14, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. It is a picture of an athlete stretching out, straining every muscle as he goes flat out to the finish. It brings to mind the footage of Mo Farah, the most successful British track athlete in modern Olympic history, with his chest out, head held high, legs and arms pumping furiously as he ran to the finish line to win the gold medal in the 5,000 meters in the 2012 Olympics. It is with the same determination that Paul pursues his ambition to know Christ. In verses 15 to 17, Paul urges the Christians at Philippi to follow his example and the example of others in this ambition and it is an encouragement to us too. Let's take some time to pause for discussion in our groups. What are your ambitions in life? And what do you think about Paul's ambition?
Paul contrasts his great ambition for Jesus with two wrong types of ambition. The first is his own ambition before he became a Christian. He describes how he puts his confidence in the flesh, in outward privileges and physical advantages and external appearances, trusting in the different marks of his old religion. But as the great theologian Karl Barth once said, Jesus Christ came to destroy human religion. God wants you to be confident, but not in the flesh. Rather, your confidence should be in God alone, his love and provision. Before his conversion, Paul's religious ambition and zeal were misdirected. He ended up persecuting the church. The second wrong type of ambition is the material and earthly focus of so many in the world around us. Verse 19 tells us, they are headed for destruction, their God is their appetite, they brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. Who are these people and why are they heading for destruction? Paul tells us three things about them which show us that their ambitions were in an entirely different direction to those of Paul. They were self-centered ambitions. First, their appetites dictate their lifestyle. He tells us in verse 19 that their God is their stomach. For some, their lives might literally revolve around their eating and drinking habits, but that might be too narrow an interpretation. Paul is likely referring to those whose God is personal satisfaction and whose lives revolve around the pursuit of pleasure. Of course, God made us sensual beings. John's Gospel tells us that Jesus himself became flesh. The body is not evil. We were created to enjoy all our bodily senses, whether sight, smell, hearing, touch, or taste. There is nothing wrong with enjoying food, alcohol, music, exercise, clothes, or sex within the boundaries God has designed. But when these things take the place of the one true God and Jesus Christ as the center of our lives, it can lead to a path of destruction. The second thing Paul tells us about the enemies of the cross, is that they boast when they should blush. In verse 19, he writes, their glory is in their shame. They are like robbers who boast about all they've stolen, or those who revel in being greedy, or those who boast about using others for personal gain. They might think there is glory and ambition in this, but these are false gods. Third, their minds are locked into this planet. He says, their mind is on earthly things. In Matthew 6, verse 21, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our ambitions are about personal gain, our thoughts will be earthly. If our ambition is to know Christ, we have an eternal perspective. The Christian is a citizen of heaven. Paul returns once again to the familiar image of citizenship, which he used in Philippians 1. Then he had urged them to be worthy citizens of heaven. Now he reminds them again of this true home where their hearts should be set. Verse 21 says, The Lord Jesus Christ, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Our bodies are lowly in that they are wearing out. Our bodily strength gradually fails. Our mental capacity diminishes. Our bodies are also lowly in that we constantly need to battle against temptation to control our tongues and our appetites. So it is absurd to make a God out of them. We all face death. It's the ultimate statistic, one in one die. If we seek God's glory, then Jesus will transform these bodies which are subject to decay and sin to be like his glorious body, which will never age or decay and will not be subject to sinful desires. It is the certainty of our own bodily resurrection and the promise of eternity with God that motivates us to, like Paul, press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has took hold of me. As we look to Jesus on the cross, we see God's love for us, which then transforms our life and informs our vision and purpose for our own time here on earth. In 1865, slavery was abolished in the United States, but it was replaced by segregation, laws and practices which excluded black people from the rest of society. For example, in Montgomery, Alabama, 
the first 10 seats of every bus were reserved for white people. Black people sitting anywhere else in the bus were expected to give up their seat to a white person when these rows were full. Rosa Parks, a 42-year-old tailor's assistant in a Montgomery department store, was traveling home on the bus after a hard day's work on the 1st of December, 1955. She was sitting in the 11th row. Six white people got on and the bus driver called to her, you, you, get up. She refused. Commenting later, I knew someone had to take the first step and I made up my mind not to move. The bus driver called the police and she was arrested and imprisoned. Looking back, she observed that she'd always been a timid person, but she said, my entire life has demanded of me that I be courageous. This spontaneous individual action by this Christian woman gave rise to a collective movement that would force the United States to confront its legacy of racial inequality. In the words of one black leader, at that moment, somewhere in the universe, a gear in the machinery shifted. On Monday, the 5th of December, the boycott of the buses began. Thousands gathered that night to hear Martin Luther King preach at Holt Street Baptist Church. Unsurprisingly, he spoke of Rosa Parks saying, nobody can doubt the height of her character. No one can doubt the depth of her Christian commitment and devotion to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And you know, friends, there comes a time when people get tired of being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression. But those iron feet of oppression deprived both Rosa and her husband of their jobs in the following weeks, and threats were made to kill them. But Rosa Parks was not easily frightened by death, observing, well, you have to die sometime. If this boycott happens to be attributed to me and my actions, and they killed me, then I'd just be dead. On the 13th November, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that the Montgomery Segregated Seating Ordinance was unconstitutional. This led to a bombing campaign in which several black churches and homes of ministers were destroyed. On Friday, the 21st of December, 1956, integrated bus services began in Montgomery. In 1980, Rosa Parks became the first woman to receive the Martin Luther King Nonviolent Peace Prize. The same year, Ebony Magazine honored her as the living black woman who had done the most to advance the cause of civil rights. In 1984, at the age of 71, she demonstrated against the racial policies of the South African government. Years before, when she had defied segregation, she had vowed, I plan not to give up until all are free. We are all soldiers and we must keep on as long as we can in this battle for freedom and justice for all. Rosa Parks was following the downward path of Paul and ultimately the path of Jesus, who said, pick up your cross and follow me. In this passage, Paul tells us that everyone is on one of two paths. There are two destinations. One is heading for heaven, the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of our bodies to be like his glorious body. The other is heading for destruction. There are two powers at work, the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit and the power of bodily appetites. There are two possible lifestyles, those willing to share in his sufferings and those who want a lifestyle of ease and comfort. There are two possible gods, our Lord Jesus Christ or our stomachs. There are two possible attitudes to Jesus, either friendship at an intimate level or enemies of the cross. Ultimately, there are only two possible ambitions, either Jesus-centered ambition or our own self-centered ambition. At times, all of us may be driven to become greater, more important, more honored, more highly promoted or better qualified. 
These are not all bad aims in themselves, but our daily choices will be swayed by these ambitions. You have to choose how you live your life. Are you focused on your promotion or on exalting Jesus? Is your ambition more for yourself or for Jesus? Paul says, in effect, I have changed my ambitions. Now I am Jesus-centered. Will you join me? Let's take some time to pause for discussion in our groups. How can you live with an eternal perspective? Are there any areas of your life where you might need to change from self-centered to Jesus-centered ambitions? Pray and ask God to help you. Thanks so much for joining us for this session of A Life Worth Living as we explored how Jesus gives us new ambitions. Take some time now to close in prayer.